Welcome to Napa Valley Sessions, a quest for Premier Napa Valley, the first of a two-night series in celebration of our Premier Napa Valley Release Week. My name is Connor Best, Head of International Marketing with Napa Valley Vintners. Tonight, we explore the journey of how and why these Premier Napa Valley wines find their way into collectors' cellars around the world. If you haven't done so already, please visit our Release Week page at www www.premiernapavalley.com to see where you can find these wines available for purchase. Without further ado, I turn this session over to our host, Alder Yarrow, the creator and writer behind Venography Wine Blog, who has a long history with Premier Napa Valley and is a great friend of the Napa Valley. Alder, over to you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, really, uh, really great to have you here this evening and really exciting to, uh, to explore Premier Napa Valley wines. Um, we are having some slight technical difficulties in getting one of our panelists on. Um, and so hopefully that will, that will take care of itself as we, as we go along. Uh, we're missing our, our retail partner, Peggy Perry from Willow Park Wine and Spirits. But I am joined this evening uh, by Brooke Schenk, the winemaker for St. Supery Winery and by Ted Edwards, who is winemaker emeritus at Fremark Abbey, where he was the active winemaker for 35 plus years, I think, Ted? Yeah, going on 40. <laughs> going on 40, excellent. Um, and so we are here to explore uh, Premier Napa Valley wines, and in particular, two Premier Napa Valley wines, one from each of St. Supery and Fremark Abbey uh, this evening, along with, uh, with Peggy, uh, the retailer, uh, who is offering those wines for sale. So while we're waiting for, for, for Peggy to join us, maybe let's, we can start by talking about the, the wines themselves. And for those perhaps less familiar with uh, the Premier Napa Valley wines, um, let me give a, just a brief overview of what these wines entail. So these wines have been called some of the rarest wines uh, in Napa, and that is almost certainly true. Um, they are wines that in some cases are made once and only once. Um, they represent unique auction lots uh, created by each winery. And sometimes these auction lots are very distinctive and different uh, grape varieties that perhaps the winery doesn't produce a single um, uh, varietal bottling of, or sometimes they are unique blends um, that are not repeated in a winery's normal lineup, or occasionally they are simply the creme de la creme, the sing, uh, single best barrel uh, out of perhaps a winery's top uh, bottling for the year. But in any case, each winery strives to make uh, this individual wine special for each premier Napa Valley auction, uh, where they are auctioned off to members of the trade, the retailers like uh, our partner Peggy, who's gonna join us this evening and, and others. Um, and for the purposes of raising, uh, raising funds for the Napa Valley Vintners. Um, and so tonight, I want to talk a little bit about um, these individual wines and, uh, and what goes into them. So we'll hear from, from Brooke and Ted about how making a Premier Napa Valley wine is different than, than normal. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, selling them when, um, uh, uh, when, when, when Peggy joins us. So maybe, Brooke, if, if we could start with you. Uh, at St. Supery, I think the the um, uh, the wine that we are uh, considering tonight is a 2011 uh, auction lot from St. Supery, um, and uh, and so if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about uh, about this wine, and uh, all we all remember the 2011. We have Peggy here. Uh, she is on the screen. Excellent. Hello, Sorry Peggy. about that, you guys. My Zoom link did not want to work on my uh, desktop, so I finally. Started using my iPad, but I heard, I could hear you guys. Ah, so okay. I heard your uh, wonderful introduction. So my Excellent. apologies for being late. No problem, everybody. So welcome, Peggy. Um, and so we, we were just going to talk about uh, about the Saint Supery lot. Um, Brooke, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what what made that wine special and and where it came from? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, the whole premise behind Premier, as Alder said, is we're trying to make the best wine possible. So for St. Supery, we usually donate um, 20, 20 cases, which is one barrel. So we make about 2,000 barrels of red every vintage around that. We're in a state winery, so it depends on the vintage. And out of those 2,000 barrels, I, we blend one barrel down for this special, unique Premier blend. 
And that one barrel isn't just, so just that barrel isn't selected. We actually will blend in um, a few different lots. This 2011 actually has four different parcels in it. Um, it is a Cabernet Sauvignon. It has about 93% Cabernet and 6% uh, Merlot and 2% Petit Verdot. It's all off of our Rutherford Vineyard, which is about 35 acres planted um, in Rutherford in Napa. And our whole premise is we're just trying to make the best blend possible for that vintage. The single most single barrel best blend possible off of this property here at Rutherford. Got it. Yeah, and 2011 was not an easy vintage. Uh, many people have called it uh, one of the most difficult vintages uh, in, in Napa in recent years, perhaps since 1998, which was also kind of a cold and, and, and rainy vintage. Um, uh, do you happen to know when, uh, when the fruit for this wine was picked? Because uh, it tastes very clean, really beautiful, very bright, um, like you didn't suffer at all from some of the things that many people suffered from. <laughs> Yeah, 2011. Um, I've worked at St. Supri since 2006, and I've actually, um, my first vintage was 1999. Um, 2011, up to that point, was definitely the roughest vintage that I'd been through, because it was a very cool vintage, and the harvest season, uh, there wasn't a lot of sunshine, so um, obviously we need sunshine to ripen, <laughs> and we had a little rain during the vintage as well, so, um, but it was amazing being a state winery because we were able to make some pretty um, crazy decisions out there. We actually um, dropped some fruit and got some blocks down to just one cluster per shoot because we needed to get them ripened. And as Alder pointed out, we did end up picking in late October <laughs> um, when some vintages you know, we would be done at the beginning of October. It just depends on the season. So I want to say the last grapes were brought in the beginning of November, actually in 2011. So um, this Rutherford lots, they would have been end of the last week of October is mm. when we brought them in. So it was a difficult season, but you can see, I do have a little bit that I pulled from the library and um, it's showing beautifully. Yeah. It really is. And I have to say, you know, for, for those of you, we're, we're, this is the only wine where we actually have the auction lot tonight. Um, these wines are, we've called them rare. They are, they are so rare that in many cases, the wineries themselves don't have a single bottle of this wine left. It's only the, you know, the 20 bottles or the 60 bottles or the 200 bottles that they've, that they've sold to whoever their winning bidder are. But in this case, I, I do have uh, this wine with me and it's really a treat because I, I taste all these wines at the barrel auction along with the trade and I get to see them very much in their youth and then never again. I never get to taste them in their mature form. And so it's a, it's a huge pleasure to see this wine, which I thought was very good uh, when I tasted it. I went back and looked at my notes and thought it was bright and, and, and juicy and, and delicious out of the barrel. Um, and it's, it's, it's equally delicious delicious now. So Peggy, maybe we can, that's a good transition to you. You're the person who, who you know, tasted this in 2012 and decided that you wanted to buy it. Um, tell us a little bit about why you buy Premier Wines in general, and then maybe if you have particular memories of this wine, we'd love to hear it. Well, I, uh, I remember buying this wine because I, uh, I loved that it was so fresh and had such lovely acidity. Um, I uh, did all my initial training in the wine business in Bordeaux, and so I have really, uh, you know, Bordeaux palate and, you know, I'm used to wines that are a little bit leaner, a little, you know, a little more acidity, uh, less ripe. And so um, I remember being at this barrel auction, of course, loving all the wines because they were, you know, more probably um, what I became exposed to as a very young taster. Um, and so um, this was a early lot that year, lot 11. And uh, I was very excited to get it. And uh, of course, knew, uh, um, knew all everybody at St. Supri. And we were just really excited to, to get one of the barrels. It was, I think, our second St. Supri barrel that we purchased and, uh, and have become quite good friends with everybody. And so uh, the French ownership has always really dictated a, a more restrained style at St. Supri. And uh, so it's been a favorite of mine for many, many years. Uh, I originally went to Napa for premiere the very first year in 1997. And uh, because I wanted to develop relationships with the wineries, 
Uh, I had spent quite a bit of time in Europe, three years training, working, studying. I knew lots of winemakers in Europe, but I didn't really know anybody in Napa. And so the premier event was the excuse for me to go and establish some good uh, connections. And those connections became friendships. And uh, like our friends at St. Supri, we really, uh, really enjoy supporting the lots at the auction. Right. Yeah, the relationship building is, is, is extraordinary at that event. It's, it's rare to see so many winery principals, you know, all, you know, the winery, the winemakers, the winery owners, all there chatting and, and tasting over the, over the barrel lots. Tell me a little bit about your thinking as a retailer, right? So you're there, you're obviously building relationships, but you're also going to plunk down a good chunk of cash for, for some really amazing wine, do you know who you're going to sell it to when you buy it? What's your, what's the strategy we're not, for you? Yeah, we're not, we're not that organized to tell you the truth. Uh, we just tend to buy barrels that we like. Um, a few times we've taken friends with us who got very excited about a barrel and asked us if they could buy, you know, half of it. And we've done that, but primarily we're buying these barrels um, to really help illustrate what uh, Napa is doing you know, what it's doing at its best, at its top level. And uh, we enjoy sharing the wines with our um, customers. We do uh, have restaurateurs who buy them and show them in their restaurants as well. That's sort of developed over the years. But uh, yeah, we just have a steady uh, clientele who have grown to love these exclusive, rare, unusual barrels. And I think people love that uh, cachet. They love these... Um, the, the uniqueness of having a wine that had such a small production that was, you know, created for a specific occasion. And as I like to say, an occasion where all the winemakers are out tasting each other's successes. <laughs> and so right. there's a fair bit of uh, competition in the room to create a wonderful wine. And of course, it guarantees that these barrels are exceptional. Yeah, I describe them very much as you do, you know, ostensibly the highest quality wine that any given uh, participating vintner could make in that year. And so one of the reasons I go is to say, all right, well, what's the apogee of the vintage, right? With, you know, what, you know, in this case, 2011, what is 2011 really capable of? And, you know, as expressed by each of the, the 200 different uh, uh, auction lots available at the, at the auction. Um, so there are people then it sounds like for you and your customer base that are Premier Napa Valley collectors, they're, they're there mm -hmm. waiting to hear the next, the, you know, the next auction lot you're going to buy, and they're mm -hmm. going to raise their hands and say, hey, sign me up for a few bottles of that. And, and certain collectors collect, you know, the same wines, uh, the same wineries from us. And so that's why you'll see Willow Park Wines and Spirits bidding, you know, year after year on a dozen or two dozen of the same lots, because we do have uh, a clientele that really likes to continue to taste these uh, these beautiful examples of the best of Napa year after year. That's interesting. It had never occurred to me. So you have a strategy around sort of building verticals for your customers of particular participating wineries. If that's you know if the cards go your way in the, in yeah. the bidding. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Strategy sounds a little strong, Alder, for you know the mayhem of the bidding. <laughs> <laughs> it does get it does get lively and and and, and yeah. crazy, absolutely. And then, what about yourself, Peggy? Do you get off? Do you often get an opportunity to revisit these wines and taste them oh, over yes. time? Yeah, we tend to actually drink a lot of these wines ourselves. Uh, uh -huh. I have them in my cellar and uh, some barrels. You know, when we've had a small lot with only five cases, very few case bottles found it to the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, see. We, yeah, I would say that I, I have consumed more Premier Napa Valley wines than any other single category after 35 years in the wine business. Wow. Yeah, so, for sure. This, so this is the answer to the like, what is the retailer drinking in the back room when, when exactly. all the customers are not around? It's Premier Napa Valley Wines. Yeah, and I tell you, the buzz in the store today, knowing that we were opening some of the wines and all the younger sales team that haven't had a chance to taste these, you know, everybody was, wow, yay, we get to taste some more Napa Valley Premier Wines today. So it was really exciting for, for a lot of people. That's great. Well, uh, um, it is tasting beautiful. It's, you know, kudos. It is amazing. Um, I just love the, 
freshness of the fruit and uh, I mean it's showing some age but it still has a great great run left in it absolutely and, uh, brilliant acidity which is a yeah. hallmark of the 11 vintage as you say yeah. but um wonderful balance of the fruit still there and vibrant and and, and bright but also some like roasted nut, you know, uh, you know, hazelnut quality coming mm -hmm. in or dried herbs that are starting to show those, you know, those secondary and tertiary aromas there. Um, it's really, it's quite, quite pretty. Beautiful. And you, nice big hunk of wild salmon from Canada, you know, with a nice cabanada on the side with some almonds in it. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, let's talk about our other wine. Ted, you've been, you've been, uh, uh, you've been uh, patient there, um, hopefully drinking something good as we've, as we, as we've chatted. Um, uh, the Fremark Abbey wine um, that we're uh, addressing out of Peggy's inventory tonight is the 2012 York Creek. Tell us a little bit about York Creek uh, Vineyard, which is a pretty special place in my book. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, for me, uh, winemaking, it's all about the soil. Uh, and the site that can really develop a specificity uh, for the wine, um, develops the flavors and the, the aroma and the uniqueness. <clears throat> and York Creek is located uh, it's at the uh, kind of the top of uh, Spring Mountain, uh, right around 1700 foot elevation. Um, I've been sourcing fruit off of that vineyard for several years. Um, it always uh, it makes these uh, scraggly vines uh, makes the, the fruit very small berries, uh, very concentrated uh, in terms of that ratio of color and flavor uh, to the juice, um, colors up early in the fermenter, um, and, it, and it creates unique aromas and flavors. And, and those, those flavors typically are, uh, you know, they're, they're the black flavors like the black currant and so forth. That, uh, and then uh, with, uh, you know, a, a, a little bit more tannin structure, but this is a 2012. So at this point in time, it's fairly well resolved. Uh, in addition to the, you know, the, that fruit, the cherry and the, bar, the blackberry kind of things, um, there's a forest floor, to me, there's a forest floor nuance that uh, comes out and adds to the complexity and the distinctiveness of the wine. Um, you know, it's just, a, it's a marvelous, I mean, I love, visiting that vineyard and the and when you go up there the valley views are uh, fantastic you have this panorama uh, you're you're basically uh, west of saint Helena, and so you're up there and then you kind of look out over the valley and it's just absolutely beautiful so great great grapes great wines um beautiful panorama um yeah and then you know let me speak to the vintage 2012 one of my all time favorite vintages. Uh, it was perfect, you know, coming off of 2011, which was a little more challenging. Um, 2012, uh, all the stars, uh, planets lined up on uh, 2012. Um, long growing season, um, very moderate, uh, reasonably good uh, crop. Uh, and uh, we had a long hang time. The, um, the actual harvest, uh, we were able to allow the fruit to just hang out there and develop the ripeness slowly. We weren't pushed to make any decisions. And, uh, and this one, you know, I was just looking at it and I think it was harvested, uh, you know, right around uh, the 25th of October. So late October. Um, so definitely a long ripening, a lot of hang time. Uh, and uh, so what we did was we selected out one barrel um, out of our vintage from um, York Creek. And, uh, and it was the one that we just absolutely loved and made our auction lot. And fortunately for us, Peggy loved it too. <laughs> and so York Creek is a, uh, is a vineyard source that would normally get blended into which wine that you make? Well, it's uh, it, it, right now it's going into a wine called uh, our Spring Mountain, our Spring Mountain selection, which is uh, includes York Creek, but it also includes another vineyard called Wordle. Um, you know, so it's a, it's more of a blend. So yep. this auction lot, the 2012, 
auction lot um, was specific 100% Cabernet, 100% from the York Creek Vineyard. Got it. Peggy, do you have uh, particular memories of this one? Um, I, I've bought this a few times. <laughs> I just love this. I think, again, you go back to my palate is very much more for cool, um, cooler styles of wine. And this coming from Spring Mountain, um, I, I just really was taken with it. And of course, the 2012s were really, really, um, the 2012s were very easy to taste. I think I'm going to lose you guys here. Let me just plug you in. Um, because um, the, um, you know, they were super ripe after the 2011s. And I, uh, I just remember thinking uh, that uh, we were, uh, we were going to have a hard time not buying a lot of lots that year. I don't think we managed to control ourselves. It seems to me that was one of the big years for us at the Napa premiere. <laughs> But, uh, Those wines are really difficult not to love, right? Especially as you say, after what you know can be sometimes austere. Uh, 2011's 12 was so generous and lush and beautiful, and I, I quipped at the time that you know if you didn't make good wine in 2012, it's your own damn fault because there was nothing stopping you that year. You could harvest when you wanted to harvest, like you know, no disease pressure, yeah. no heat spikes, no rain. It was just Goldilocks perfect. Yeah, no, it was there. Yeah, this this is a beautiful wine. We have a real following for Ted's wines. Uh, we've bought the barrel a number of years over the last twenty five years, and uh, we actually have bought quite a bit of the ninety four as well because that's the year we found at Willow Park Wines and Spirits, and that is an impressive wine, and we show it usually every year on our anniversary. And uh, I think from all of the Fremark Abbey we've shared with our customers over the years, uh, many, many, many of them have also purchased the Napa Valley Premier Fremark Abbey uh, as a result. Hmm. So great. kudos to you, Ted, and we're gonna miss you because well, you're retiring. <laughs> well, we, we really appreciate you, Peggy, and um, uh, being an, uh, a fan. Um, but uh, we love the relationship and uh, we, will, we will continue and I will be still involved with Fremark. Excellent. Uh, yeah, um, Christy Melton is gonna be the, the everyday winemaker. Uh, I'll be the winemaker emeritus and uh, so I'll be on her team. So I'll still be around. As they Wonderful. say, winemakers never retire. They just stop lifting barrels. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so tell us a little bit, Ted, maybe about what goes into the care and feeding of a premier Napa Valley wine once the wine is made or selected. You know, do you lock it in a corner of the winery so it doesn't get accidentally blended into the main lot? You know, do you do you put big chalk marks all over it saying do not touch? Like, how, how do you how do you treat it from between the time you decide that's going to be your lot and and when yeah. it goes in the bottle? I mean, it's just and yes, I mean, I. Um, you know, you really do have to protect it. You know, we, we go through and we taste all the barrels and we decide what it is that we want to use, which one. And, um, and so then at that point, we actually give it a specific um, lot number, uh, um, a lot number that uh, goes into our computer system. And it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's specific to that barrel and the serial number on that barrel. Uh, and then we do uh, tell you the truth, you laugh, but we actually do write chalk, chalk marks on it because we don't want any mistakes. We don't want that barrel to accidentally be pulled and pumped into something else or something added to it. And then um, we uh, judiciously, uh, the far topping material, you know, because when, when we do the, you know, the, the PNV, um, that wine is in barrel for another year um, before we bottle it. So there's a lot of protection going on, and um, and we top it uh, every four to six weeks, and we use topping material from the same vineyard, um, you know. And then at, at some point uh, we pull it out, and it's basically um, hand bottled because um, uh -huh. it's such a small lot. Got it. So it doesn't go through a bottling line of any kind. Yeah, it like doesn't that. go through. It goes through like a hand bottling situation, uh, non filtered. Um, you know, it, it, so you, you really get the, the breadth and the depth of the wine into hmm. the bottle. 
is it safe to say that maybe you've literally touched every single as the winemaker you've literally touched every single bottle of uh, of the premier napa valley wine that somebody might have in their cellar uh that's <laughs> i yeah probably <laughs> yeah I've, I've gone to every pnv um you know that, that they, they've had uh, mm -hmm. and it's uh, been a marvelous experience you know like like Peggy was saying, you know, you're, you're uh, meeting with other uh, retailers, um, trade, uh, other winemakers. You know, for me, I, when I visit uh, the PNV auction day, it's like going, it's like a class reunion and uh, going there and seeing a lot of people. Even though we live in the valley, we don't see every, everybody every day. And so it's like a collection, and there's a chance to um, shake hands and say, hi, how are you doing? And, taste everybody's wines and that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Brooke, tell me a little bit about how you treat uh, your premier auction lots at St. Superi. Is that one behind you there in the in the tank? Um, no. <laughs> 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 um, we're, the, we're similar with Ted once we put that blend together, which is about a year before it gets bottled. Um, and we've selected, you know, a couple gallons of this Rutherford Cab and Rutherford Merlot and Rutherford Petit Verdot to make this the best barrel. Then chalk marks everywhere, PNV, 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 and everybody knows that you don't touch PNV unless the winemaker says you should touch it. Um, so it is quite protected. Um, same as what Ted said, it's hand bottled, and um, you know, every single label is signed. Um, and numbered so you can have whether you're with whether you have five cases or 10 cases or 20 cases as in this case um it goes up from zero, one to 240 bottles <laughs> so um yeah so i mean super unique and really special blend and it's it is definitely a treat to try this because uh, we only keep a couple bottles back in our library and so i was excited that we had one for you alder and that i was oh my able god to to taste it, I Coravind it, and um, and I'm I'm very much enjoying it. So yeah, <laughs> just yeah. really special to be able to to drink it. <laughs> For sure. Now, do these wines get a different aging regimen than your standard, say, top flight Cabernet, or is it basically the same? For me, for us, it's um, around the same amount of time. It's usually the last wine that we bottle. But we're only talking a difference of maybe three weeks as compared to, like, say, our Rutherford Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so, but we, we usually will blend, we'll blend the, the Premier lot first and we'll bottle it last. But it probably is only maybe another four weeks difference between the other wines in, as far as age. Got it. Got it. Um, I want to encourage anybody that's watching um, to use the chat feature of Zoom. If you have questions for Brooke or Ted or Peggy, feel free to throw your questions there in chat. Otherwise, uh, we're just going to keep uh, continuing with the, with the conversation here. Um, so Peggy, um, have you tasted the, the 2012 uh, York Creek recently? Well, right tonight. Oh, you uh, have a bottle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, it's delicious. I think we have about 100 bottles left, actually. It was wow. a 20K slot. And, oh, sorry. My phone's, my phone's on here. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's uh, tasting really great. We had quite a few um, of our uh, better customers pick up bottles today to taste along with us. Oh, excellent. I'm glad. Yeah. We saw we met some of them earlier, so I'm glad they're yeah. actually <laughs> so, yeah, tasting <laughs> along, alongside. <laughs> Um, so tell us about the wine. None of us have it actually in the glass. You're the only one. So tell us a little bit about what you're tasting. Well, when Ted was describing it, talking about the classic aromatics that you find in this York Creek wine, I mean, it was exactly as he was describing it. You know, it's got beautiful, beautiful black currant and cherry notes, and uh, but also that little bit of sauvage, you know, that undergrowth, uh, just a touch, because really the red fruit is dominating. It, so the tannins are lovely they're you know they're really they really have a beautiful uh, mouth feel still and um, at, 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 with each sip you see that really lively acidity on the sides of the of your tongue and you can tell that the wine uh, which is brilliantly colored like quite mm. deeply colored not showing really any signs of 
the age. So this wine can go the distance. And um, that's reminding me, you know, the, the 94 vintage, which still today is so youthful and can really go to the distance. So this is a wine that you could keep for at least another 10 years. You've anticipated one of our questions already, but people are wondering what are the cellar life of, of both of these wines, uh, the saint Supri and the Fremark Abbey? This, well, the saint Supri is showing its age a bit more. Again, we were all very impressed when we opened it. We, di we did open and decant the wines about two hours ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've just know from past experience that all these premier wines really do benefit from a little bit of, age, you know, a little bit of oxidation. Um, but uh, the saint Supri has a little bit more of a, um, of a tinge of uh, aging in the color. So not not tawny, but it's just more plummy at the rim. Uh, and um, the um, so I would say that the St. Supri, given that it's from that cooler vintage, I probably wouldn't hold it much more than another five years. But uh, the Fremark Abbey being um, much more robust in style can go at least another 10 years. Great. Brooke and Ted, do you guys have anything to add to that about these particular wines? Yeah, I was gonna say exactly what Peggy said. Um, I, there's still some fruit showing in this, but I definitely get some aged uh, kind of mushroom and, um, and you know some black licorice and some black olive, which is showing some age. And I agree with the color. It's, um, it's definitely showing a little bit of age, but I would say, yes, yeah, five years. It still has some life in it. It's tasting amazing right now, but um, still has some life in it as well. We taste the wine. So every year we have a big charity wine auction. We always open different wines at the charity wine auction. And because we've had the pleasure of having uh, Emma Swain here at our charity wine auction, we, we have opened this wine quite a bit um, every year to taste during the auction. And uh, it, uh, it has evolved beautifully. You know, so we tasted, of course, as soon as it landed and then every year since. And um, I think it would definitely be a great seller selection and just a really nice uh, expression of Napa in a cooler vintage, like a beautifully mm -hmm. balanced wine. Yeah. yeah so and if my experience with cooler vintages in Napa is any uh, is any uh, measure of, of, of performance, you know, this wine may last longer than than everybody thinks. You know, the acidity yeah. is a real key component to that, as well as that tannic structure, which is very fine in the case of this wine. And so, you know, it depends on how whether people like the flavors of an older wine. But but I'd say this, you know, I if I had to guess, I would guess more than five years on this wine. Um, but yeah. I tend to like things as they taste older and get a bit more mature as well. Brent and Terry, uh, one of your customers, uh, Peggy, said that they bought a bottle, bought a bottle of the St. Supery recently um, and that they're dying to open it. So you guys, five <laughs> years, 10 years, tomorrow, whenever, uh, uh, it'll, it'll taste great. Um, there's a question that's coming for you, Brooke, which is around as a winemaker, how much freedom do you have in the creating of the lot every year? Which I think is a great question. Like, how do you figure out what it is that you're going to make? Yeah, it's a good question because... Um... I mean, we, we're in a state winery, so uh, we own two vineyard properties. The easy part, I guess, about um, our premier lot, it always comes from Rutherford, so I know that at least. Um, but, you know, it's just, you, you know these wines from when you picked them and when they were grown as blocks in the, at, during harvest. When you picked them, you watched them through ferment. So you have an idea about blocks and which ones you like the most. Um, but, you know, they age in barrel for a year, 14 months, or probably a year, uh, and then we're going to blend it, and, um, and, and it's tasting each of the lots, and then tasting each of the barrels in that lot, those lots as well, that are your favorites, and then just doing this bench trial, and freedom, we have, I mean, we just want to make the best wine from the vineyard so we have essentially a lot of freedom with it um, because we're just trying to showcase our very best 60 gallons <laughs> that we have from that vineyard so that's that's the premise and that's that's amazing to be able to do um, interesting so i get just to play back what i'm hearing a little bit it's it's actually it seems more like premier lot selection by deduction in a way, which is sort of like you don't have a preconceived notion of it. What you're doing is you're going through and seeing what the raw materials are available to you, 
Um, and much like somebody might shop at a farmer's market and see what's fresh that day and good and then, you know, decide on the spot what to make for dinner. Um, you're, you're choosing what those best elements are and, and crafting something based on what you've got. Yeah, and I think, I mean, um, of course, we're trying to shoot for, we definitely want a wine that's dark and fruit. We want a wine that's layered and textured and um, presentable. <laughs> um, we do have Michelle Rolan as a consultant and he does help, you know, he comes and talks us and tastes with us through the wines and will consult with us on blending as well. So that we do have that collaboration going, but for the most part, you know, we're taking all the information. It's me and Michael Scholes um, are taking the information, what we're tasting, what we know about each lot and each kind of barrel and, and putting the blend together. Every year. So it's, it's interesting you, you, uh, you mentioned barrels. Somebody's asked a question of uh, the barrel usage for these two particular wines, but I think you could also genericize that question and say, is it the same barrel type every year? Is there, you know, oh, we always use the Limousin for the Premier lot, or we always use the, the Francois Frere for Premier. Um, how does that work? So for, for us, for the 2011, and I'm just gonna walk over here because I have a special barrel for upcoming Premier lots that I'll flip over. But for 2011, we were using um, our Terenso barrels, usually um, in the past, that's kind of our, that was our highest barrel. And we would always make the lot in a Terenso barrel. Um, but our now our latest lots are in these special barrels, which hopefully you can see this, but um, wow. this is a barrel from France and um, it has like, it was planted in 1656 by uh, Louis XIV and it was cut down in 2014. So a really old tree that is now protected wow. by um, the France government I guess it's and you they only allow people to um they only allow coopers to have like one tree a year that they can cut down and make barrels out of and so for the last I think I want to say five years but maybe it's only four we've been making our premier lot in one of these barrels because we are able to get a couple every year and so that's super special um to Seriously. be able to do it in that yeah so wow that's pretty amazing. Um, and do you, um, one part of the question is sort of the new versus used oak, uh, you know, in the barrel, you know, will you typically try and have roughly a particular target percentage of, of uh, you know, it, um, not percentage, we're only talking about, you know, quantities of one barrel or less. So is it always a brand new barrel or is it sometimes a used barrel? What's the thinking? For us, 100% new barrel is this, that's how we do it, yeah. Got it. Ted? Uh, for me, um, yeah, uh, you know, the, the York Creek Vineyard has so much fruit and so much depth of character that um, I typically find I like, uh, I select a, a new barrel. Uh, and often it's a turn. So, or there's certain rural cooperage profiles that I particularly like. I like the flavors that uh, seem, seem to um, enhance the wine. Uh, and it, it always enhances the fruit component of the wine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I, I come back, I keep coming back to a, a note you gave about the, the York Creek wines of forest floor. And that's definitely something that I get in those wines as well. And it's also remarkable to just note that that vineyard is in the forest. It's surrounded by trees of all different kinds. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. It's, I think of it as very much as a sort of this alpine forested, you know, place uh, and it comes it, across. It's easy to get lost up there. You mm -hmm. know, one thing I was just going to mention for the, the patrons that are watching is um, so often the, um, the mountain fruit has a propensity or tannin. It just has a lot of tannin. And, uh, you know, so then what you do is you work to uh, mature the tannins on the vine so that when you bring them in and you make the wine, by the time you bottle it, the, tan the tannins are fairly resolved. And I'm sure, um, you know, when Peggy was talking about this wine, I, unfortunately, I don't have a bottle. <laughs> it, um, but um, it, it sounded spot on. Uh, and I'm sure the tannins are resolved uh, and, and it's a nice balance now of fruit and with a little bit of structure and which add uh, to the ageability of the wine going forward. 
Um, you know, you're looking at an eight year old line. Um, I would think it would have at least another 10 years. Yeah, yeah, some, in fact, uh, some, I unfortunately not necessarily yours, Ted's, but some of the oldest, best Napa wines I've had have been from the York Creek Vineyard. Um, they just, I don't know, that mountain fruit, that tannin, that acidity, they just last forever. I think they're beautiful, beautiful wines. It's a really special site. So um, exciting to, to have the opportunity for, for folks to buy that. And it's, it's astonishing to me that you have a lot of bottles of that, uh, uh, Peggy. Um, so that's, uh, you've clearly been hoarding them, which, uh, which is uh, to, to your benefit and to the benefit of your customers. Oh, you're on mute, my dear. Yeah, it's the uh, generosity, of course, of Fremark Abbey that they always donate 20 barrels as St. Supri does. And so we tend to, we tend to chase those 20 uh, case, uh, sorry, 20 case barrels hmm. because uh, it's a lot of bother getting that wine to Canada. <laughs> so, For sure. Yeah, do you face, uh, do you yeah. face particular challenges as a Canadian uh, retailer? We do. It seems every year we have to reteach our, you know, monopoly controlled importation system that, hey, wait, we already paid for these barrels. <laughs> <laughs> I and, see. Uh, they they, you know, they so want to tax they want to tax you twice. <laughs> yeah, and we do like to buy. We do like to have the twenty cases, you know, because we like we enjoy having the inventory, you know, for a few years, right? So most of the barrels. Um, when when they're five barrel lots, they disappear fairly quickly or five case lots. I'm sorry, um, but the 20 case lots, you know, we like to see how they evolve and we're happy to have them in our sure. inventory for five to 10 years. Yeah, I mean, they give you the opportunity to taste them over time, but they also give your customers the opportunity to go buy a bottle get really excited about it, come back, you know, and buy another yeah. one and then five years later, buy it again or whatever. So yeah. that's, that's great. That's great. Well, we are coming just about to the end of our uh, of our session here. Um, so, if anybody has any last minute questions, now's the time to to put them in the chat. Um, but uh, I, I want to say thank you to to Brooke and to Ted and to Peggy. This has been a great conversation, and it's been such a treat. Uh, Brooke, thank you to to taste this wine um, after after having tasted it eight years ago, um, and uh, and to have the uh, the the conversation. Oh, one one more came in. Um, uh, uh, he wants to know if Freemark Abbey owns part of York Creek Vineyard um, uh, and, uh, and whether you bought the Wordle Vineyard. Uh, well, the answer is that we do not own uh, York Creek Vineyard. Um, now, we, we've had a close relationship with York Creek over the years. Uh, one of our partners, one of the, the original partners in 1967, uh, was the vineyard manager and planted York Creek uh, back in the day. And so we had a particularly uh, close relationship with Fritz Maytag, which uh, owns uh, York Creek. Now, what was the other part of your question? Oh, whether you own the Wordle Vineyard as well. Oh, Wordle. Um, no, the Wordle is a, um, it's a lease. I, I, basically, we control it. It, it is a, a lease. Um, okay. Do we, do we do the farming? Great. Good. Well, I a number of you are putting in your appreciation for this uh, session and your ability to uh, to connect with folks uh, and and see faces and hear names and and get a chance to taste the wine under you know less than normal or ideal circumstances. So I really I thank you all for coming out this evening, in particular Brooke, Ted, and Peggy for for sharing your time and your wines, um, and uh, and it was a great a great conversation. I really I really enjoyed it. Thank you.